British physician Edward Jenner is usually thought of as the father of vaccination. But did you know that someone else introduced inoculation to England several decades earlier? In other parts of the world, in fact, the practice had been happening for centuries. Hi, I'm Erin McCarthy. We're covering that and much more in this episode of The List Show, from historical anti-vaxxers to a heartwarming fact about the polio vaccine that isn't exactly what it seems. Let's get started. Lady Mary Wortley Montague, born in 1689, was a poet and essayist married to the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. When she was 26, a bout with smallpox left her with facial scars. She and her husband moved to Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, Turkey, in 1716. Lady Mary explored the city's women-only apartments and public baths, where she witnessed Ottoman women inoculating people against distemper. In a letter, she described the women applying the matter of the best sort of smallpox to small cuts in patients' arms or legs, after which they would suffer a very mild case of the disease and then recover. No one ever died, she wrote, and following the procedure, they were immune to the illness. Montague was so convinced of the practice's safety that she intended to introduce it to the British medical establishment. In 1721, a smallpox outbreak in London prompted her to have her daughter inoculated, the first known instance of the procedure in England but many doctors remained skeptical. That August, an experiment that would never be approved today was conducted at Newgate Prison. A group of inmates were given the option of freedom if they submitted to inoculation and lived. They all survived. After that, the Princess of Wales inoculated some of her children, and again they were fine. The procedure became widespread. The princess wasn't the only European royal worried about viruses. Russia's Catherine the Great summoned an English doctor, Thomas Dimsdale, to St. Petersburg in 1768 to administer a smallpox inoculation to herself and her son, Grand Duke Paul. The operations had high stakes. While Dimsdale prepared the injection, there were said to be a number of carriages at the ready in case something went wrong and the doctor needed to escape an angry mob of the Empress's followers. Fortunately, the top secret procedure went off without a hitch. The same year as the Newgate prison experiment, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was suffering from its own smallpox outbreak. Years earlier, the colony tried to keep the disease at bay by initiating the first quarantine in the North American colonies. Governor John Winthrop ordered all ships arriving from the Caribbean, in which yellow fever was widespread, to remain offshore until cases of the plague or like infectious diseases were resolved. Epidemics still struck the colony fairly regularly. It would take a while for inoculation to be adopted on this side of the Atlantic, but information supporting the practice already existed in a number of cultures. By the early 1700s, forms of inoculation had been practiced in India and China for more than a century. The written record is a bit spare, with explicit references dating only to around the mid-1500s. Some experts believe the practice significantly predates that record, though. The information may have been passed down as part of an oral tradition. By 1714, a couple of years before Lady Montague arrived in the Ottoman Empire, a physician named Emmanuel Timonius wrote about how inoculation was becoming increasingly prevalent in Constantinople in a letter printed in Philosophical Transaction. Two years later, Puritan minister Cotton Mather, best known for his role in the Salem Witch Trials, wrote his own letter supporting Timonius' account. Mather probably hadn't witnessed inoculation at this point, but he had secondhand knowledge of the practice from an enslaved man who worked for him. Mather described an incident in which he asked the man, whom he called Onesimus, if he had ever had smallpox. Onesimus answered, both yes and no, and described how people in his homeland applied infectious pus to patients' scratched arms, rendering them immune to the disease. Again, the written record makes it hard to trace this tradition. For what it's worth, a late 18th century French writer later claimed that many West Africans had been conducting inoculation since time immemorial. In any case, when Boston was hit by a smallpox epidemic in 1721, Mather urged doctors to use inoculation in their fight against the disease. As in England, many were skeptical. Some argued that inoculation went against God's commandments. Someone even threw a grenade through Mather's window with a note that read, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you. I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. One doctor, Zabdiel Boylston, did inoculate nearly 300 patients. The process was far from perfect. Roughly 2% of those patients died. But compared to smallpox's fatality rate of about 15 to 30%, Boylston's meticulous records demonstrated to many that inoculation had the potential to save lots of lives. Inoculation, or lack thereof, played a role in the lives of America's founders. Benjamin Franklin became a strong proponent of the medical intervention after losing his four-year-old son Francis to smallpox in November 1736. Some in Philadelphia began a rumor that the boy was inoculated, but had died anyway. Franklin set the record straight and later wrote in his autobiography, I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given it to him by inoculation. This I mention for the sake of parents, who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died under it. My example showing that the regret may be the same either way, 
and that therefore the safer should be chosen. In 1764, the future second president, John Adams, was inoculated in Boston during yet another smallpox outbreak there. At the time, doctors accompanied the procedure with an unnecessary regimen of purging and sweating via large doses of mercury and, oddly enough, milk. Adams wrote in his autobiography that the treatment caused him to drool so much that every tooth in his head loosened. By such means they conquered the smallpox, which I had very lightly, but they rendered me incapable of speaking or eating in my old age. In short, the same situation with my friend Washington. Speaking of Washington, the commander-in-chief insisted that all of his troops in the Continental Army get inoculated. In 1776, half of the 10,000 Continental Army soldiers in Quebec, including their commander, came down with smallpox. The unit retreated, leaving the territory in British hands, and arguably leading to Canada's status as a separate country today. The defeat may have convinced Washington to mandate inoculation for the Army in 1777. Inoculation did have a few drawbacks. One was that newly inoculated patients could pass on the disease as they recovered from their mild case. And there was no standardized dosage to ensure that the case would, in fact, be mild. It was better than nothing, but left a lot to be desired. Then Edward Jenner came along. Jenner's big breakthrough came from looking into how exposure to a less deadly related virus conferred immunity to a deadlier one. In 1796, he treated a milkmaid named Sarah Nelms for a cowpox infection which she said she got from her cow Blossom. In his famous experiment, he took pus from Nelms' sores and inoculated an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps with it. Phipps recovered, and Jenner inoculated the kid with smallpox material. Phipps did not get sick. The procedure in which a weaker or dead virus confers immunity became known as vaccination, after the Latin word waca, meaning cow. Technically, in Jenner's day at least, inoculation referred to the act of applying infectious material to a skin lesion, while vaccination referred specifically to applying less dangerous cowpox material to avert smallpox. Today, the two terms are often used interchangeably to refer to any practice in which something is introduced to the body to help the immune system protect against disease. Back in the 18th century, the bovine connection gave some people the wrong idea. Many were suspicious of a medical treatment derived from a cow, not to mention the concept of purposefully getting one disease to prevent another. Some claimed that mingling animal and human substances went against biblical tenets. A famous historical anti-vaxxer named Benjamin Mosley even warned people that vaccination might lead to quadrupedin sympathy. In other words, at least half seriously it seems, Mosley thought an unlucky vaccinated person might become attracted to cows. Illustrator James Gilray captured the hysteria with a cartoon depicting miniature cows morphing out of people's bodies. Of course, none of those dire predictions came true. But what happened to Blossom, the only actual cow involved in the story? She likely recovered from the cowpox infection, since its lesions tend to heal within a month or so. Today, her hide is preserved and mounted at St. George's Medical School in London, and one of her horns is part of the collection at Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden in Gloucestershire, England. One problem with vaccination, however, was that scientists couldn't yet manufacture a vaccine. The viral material had to come from an already infected person. That made public health vaccination campaigns difficult. The Spanish government found an unconventional, highly unethical workaround in 1803. King Carlos IV wanted to vaccinate people in Spain's American and Philippine colonies. Physicians came up with a plan involving a ship, a crew, and 22 orphan children. The idea was to set sail and then vaccinate the children in succession, with one child providing the cowpox to the next one, and so on forming a human chain and ensuring access to the valuable viral material. While the kids were eventually settled in Mexico, the captain of the voyage, Francisco Javier de Balmis, continued his round-the-world vaccination mission for the next four years. Vaccination became the gold standard in medicine because it was so much safer than inoculation. In fact, the UK banned variolation, another name for inoculation with a smallpox virus, in 1840 with the passage of the National Vaccination Act. This law also provided free vaccines for the poor, the first instance of free medical services in the UK. Vaccination for newborns became mandatory there in 1853, and in 1855, Massachusetts passed the first state law in the US requiring them for school children. With the need for vaccine doses growing every year, scientists devised a method for propagating cowpox among calves for the use in vaccines, a product they called animal vaccine. Basically, scientists harvested infectious fluid from the cows for use in smallpox vaccines. This was safer than transferring pus from one person to another because it cut down on the risk of transmitting other diseases such as syphilis. After a Boston physician introduced the concept to US researchers, entrepreneurs quickly opened vaccine farms to increase production. 
The New York City Board of Health opened a vaccine farm in Clifton, New Jersey in 1876 to raise cows infected with cowpox. By 1897, more than 14 major vaccine farms operated across at least six states. Drivax, a smallpox vaccine manufactured by Wyeth Laboratories and used for most of the 20th century in vaccination campaigns, was derived from a strain harvested at the New York Board of Health vaccine farm. Smallpox received a lot of attention because it was so deadly, but it wasn't the only viral disease for which scientists raced to create vaccines. French chemist Louis Pasteur developed the rabies vaccine in the 1880s. Previously, Pasteur discovered that bacteria lost their virulence over time, a process he called attenuation. In a landmark 1881 experiment, he vaccinated a group of livestock twice with attenuated anthrax vaccine and left a control group unvaccinated. About two weeks later, he exposed all of the animals to live anthrax. Within a few days, you guessed it, the unvaccinated sheep and goats had died while the vaccinated ones remained healthy. So Pasteur developed a similar tactic with the lethal rabies virus. He and a colleague extracted tissue from rabid dogs and injected a solution of it into a series of rabbits where the virus weakened. Pasteur air-dried the rabbit's spinal cords. Exposure to oxygen reduced the virus until it was no longer infectious, and then administered the material to 50 more dogs who remained healthy. Seems like a success, right? Two problems. Pasteur was not a medical doctor, and he definitely didn't have a license to test his vaccine in humans. But that's exactly what he did when the mother of nine-year-old Joseph Meester brought the boy, who had been bitten by a rabid dog, to Pasteur's laboratory. Over the course of 11 days, Meester received 13 shots and survived. As an adult, Meester worked as a caretaker at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. There's a long-standing legend attached to the development of the polio vaccine in the early 1950s. Numerous researchers were working on polio vaccines at the time, using forms of a live polio virus. Jonas Salk, a virologist at the University of Pittsburgh, with funding from the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, developed a vaccine using an inactivated virus, which was administered by injection. He took what seemed like risky steps. He tested the vaccine by inoculating his family, and then launched a clinical trial of more than a million children aged between six and nine. But the trial showed the vaccine prevented infection. Salk did not patent the vaccine, allegedly because he wanted it given to children far and wide, regardless of cost. Could you patent the sun, he asked in a televised conversation with Edward R. Murrow in 1955. People took it as a moral statement against patenting medical breakthroughs, but the reality is a bit more complicated. The year it was unveiled, according to Claire Gaudiani's The Greater Good, 80 million people donated money to the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. As Brian Palmer argued in a piece for Slate, in this particular case, patenting and profiting off a vaccine that had been developed with so many donations would have been seen as double charging. In fact, many of those donations were small sums from the not particularly well off, helping give rise to the foundation's current name, the March of Dimes. Salk's public profile as a savior of children led TV viewers to assume his poetic rhetorical question was meant to apply to all vaccines in a purely altruistic vein, but it may have been more contingent on the details of his particular vaccine and its origins. Viewers also didn't know that the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis had actually looked into patenting the technology. Its lawyers concluded that the vaccine wouldn't be patentable because of prior art. In other words, because other researchers had been working on polio vaccines and Salk had built on their research, his invention wasn't unique. It's not clear that the foundation ever intended to profit on this hypothetical patent. It might have just been a way of preventing other companies from making low-quality knockoffs of the vaccine. But it does perhaps undercut some of the nobility of Salk's lofty question. Albert Sabin later developed a polio vaccine using the live polio virus that could be administered orally, which made distribution much easier. And at the height of the Cold War, Sabin and his Soviet counterpart, Mikhail P. Chumakov, collaborated on a vaccination campaign in the USSR. In 1959, 10 million Soviet children received Sabin's oral vaccine. In 1960, 100 million people behind the Iron Curtain were vaccinated. In another instance of vaccine diplomacy, the USSR, with US funding, provided millions of doses of a freeze-dried smallpox vaccine to developing countries. We couldn't give you facts about vaccines without mentioning the COVID-19 vaccines that are giving us a way out of this pandemic. The Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines are mRNA vaccines. And while it might seem like this technology just emerged from nowhere, scientists have been working on the core ideas for decades, and had even tested mRNA vaccines before the current pandemic. mRNA vaccines don't contain any of the coronavirus, live or dead. Instead, when you receive your shot, molecules called messenger RNA tell your cells to start creating a spike protein that's found in the coronavirus itself. Then your immune system makes antibodies against that protein. You already have mRNA in every cell of your body, 
It's the protein that transports messages from your DNA to the rest of your cells. The mRNA vaccines use the same kind of molecule to tell your cells to make a harmless bit of the coronavirus's spike protein. After the protein is made, your cells break down the vaccine's mRNA. Despite what some misinformed online researchers might claim, the vaccine doesn't change your DNA. And no, the shots don't contain microchips. If you've enjoyed the Mental Floss channel this year, please consider subscribing or sharing one of our videos with a friend. Thanks for watching.